It is now my pleasure to introduce the first speaker in the presidential plenary, AN President Dr. Stephen Sergei. Dr. Sergei was born in Johannesburg, South Africa, and educated at the University of Witwatersrand, graduating from medical school in 1970. After two and a half years in hospitals in Johannesburg, he obtained his neurologic training at the Longwood Harvard Neurology Training Program in Boston. He then worked as a neurologist at the Leahy Clinic Foundation in Boston before moving to Tampa, where he is now the managing partner of a five-person neurology group. Since becoming a member of the AN in 1976, Dr. Sergei has chaired many committees and led the 1997 AN strategic planning efforts and the Commission on Subspecialization. He recognized early on the importance and inevitability of subspecialization in neurology and put into motion the necessary steps leading to accreditation of training programs and subspecialists. This work resulted in the creation of UCNS, which he chaired from 2003 to 2006. As president, Dr. Sergei's focus has been on creating a more strategic, nimble, and proactive academy. A voracious reader himself, he asked committee members and chairs to read voraciously themselves. Some of his suggested book titles, at least those relating to management organizations, tell the story. Good to Great by Jim Collins and Wisdom of Crowds by James Surovicki. Under his tenure, the Academy has indeed progressed further on a trajectory towards greatness with democratic input from all AAN members. In keeping with his international past and current interests, Dr. Sergei also serves, the AAN as, serves as the AAN representative to the World Federation of Neurology and has been appointed to the WFN Education Executive Committee and to the WFN Africa Task Force. The title of his presenta presentation today is Doctoring 2009, Embracing the Challenge. Please welcome Dr. Sergei. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Doctoring faces many challenges in 2009, all potentially imperiling our professional soul or our ethos of life as physicians. Our response requires high-minded judgment, which Ramon Cajal, in his book Advice to Young Investigator, described as the dominant trait of scientists when gazing towards the serene universe of ideas. He believed that scientific reflection involved exploring one's own mind and soul. The House of Medicine exists within society and since the beginning of time we've had to contend with the scientific, social, political and economic concerns of the day, some sustaining and others threatening our core beliefs. We are not unique in 2009 in having to embrace challenges and today's merely define our agenda. Neuroscience research, education, and the practice of neurology have never been more fulfilling. As a practicing, community-based, adult, general clinical neurologist for over 30 years, I have witnessed human resilience in illness and recovery, and as spokesperson for the Academy, I have shared neurology in the United States and around the world. Now, as my presidency draws to a close, I stand back and I savor our dreams for our profession while recognizing that in the United States today, these dreams and those of our patients are clouded by a sense of unfulfilled promise. While I accept that it is the privilege and the duty of leadership to respond to challenges, I am mindful also of the unsurpassed opportunities offered by the United States medical system recognized worldwide and which provided me, a South African immigrant, with incomparable neurology residency training and a lifetime of professional opportunities. In worldwide terms, our challenge is not the absence of opportunity, but rather our reducing opportunity and the discomfort of bearing witness to what we see as the diminishing of our proud profession. I share with you a sense of urgency to make our value more apparent. I believe that it is realistically possible to restore optimism to our profession 
and meaning to our debate with our policy makers. My career as a neurologist has been dedicated to face-to-face -to -face care delivery and the physician-patient relationship is therefore of elemental significance to me. The destination of my talk is the definition of a new method of dialogue to rescue medical professionalism from what is becoming an entrepreneurial occupation in which we are asked to deliver a commodity. I'm compelled to do so to ensure that our center of attention on humanity is never lost and that our patients never become just another statistic. In his book, The Death of the Gills, published in 1996, Krauss wrote that in Western capitalistic democracies, when endeavors are sufficiently costly to negatively impact the agendas of business and governing, they are incorporated into business to further the ends of the state. Medicine, he stated, was following in the footsteps of other professions and that this end was inevitable. Krauss did not believe that the medical profession was dying, but that our guild power was and would be replaced by the power of business. Unlike our predecessors, tomorrow's physicians would serve their employers' goals and would become like other technicians whose sense of purpose had been expropriated. I believe that for, for physicians in the United States and in much of the Western world, this transformation of medical care to a business and of physicians to employees is moving forward at a rapid rate. The following movie clip resonates with my concern about our current health planning. The Third Man was chosen by the British Film Institute as the best British film of the 20th century and, and took place in post-World War II Vienna. Harry Lyme was played by Orson Welles and was accused of diluting the new wonder drug penicillin. He was confronted about this by a friend while riding high on Vienna's famous Ferris wheel. Lyme explained his behavior looking down on people who appeared like tiny dots on the ground. In medicine, we never consider people merely to be dots, but it appears to those who plan healthcare delivery, the statistics of our economic well-being have become more important than the health and well-being of individual human beings. Pellegrino, the father, the father of healthcare ethics, argues that healthcare, rather than being a commodity, is human activity, responding to the needs of ill humans whose overwhelming fear is abandonment to their fate by their fellow human beings, and that to convert the ends of medicine to the purposes of economics, politics, or professional prerogative transforms medicine into economics, politics, and professional preference and not the health caring process for which we all became doctors. I am concerned by our acceptance of the seeming inevitability of these changes initiated by the theft of our identities in changing our names from doctors to providers, in referring to patients as lives or customers, and by characterizing the patient-physician relationship as only one of a multitude of encounters. I personally refuse to discard the clothing of the doctor, which carries with it my unavoidable responsibility to behave and function as the administering high priest of humans. When as stated by Pellegrino, our patients are in vulnerable states and have to be confident enough to reveal to us the most personal and intimate recesses of their lives. Similarly, I refuse to abandon my stewardship of the physician-patient relationship and of our patient's autonomy. I, like you, am fully aware of the economics of medical care delivery as the escalating cost in the United States, both individually and collectively, exceeds any nation on earth. 